Hi, welcome to Minutes with Mickey, a time for us to wonder about the story Elijah on Mount Horeb, which we find in 1 Kings chapter 19. The beginning of this story is right after what happened when uh, Elijah had that fabulous, powerful moment of victory over Jezebel's uh, prophets of Baal. And Ahab runs back and tells Jezebel what happened, and Jezebel is determined to kill Elijah. Elijah, instead of standing up against the evil, turns and runs. There's two thing I, one, things I wonder about about this one. Is the reason that he turns and runs because that mountaintop experience has totally spent him? Or is it simply because God is not ready to deal with Jezebel yet? We'll get to that later. But as Elijah turns and runs, we notice here in the story that somehow he almost behaves as if he's depressed. In spite of that wonderful, powerful experience that he had with God over Baal's prophets, um, he now is at a point where he's completely spent, depressed, you could say, because what we see here is all he's doing is eating and sleeping. An angel tends to him. But we have nothing in the text that tells us that he seems to be appreciative or grateful or surprised by this bread that sort of shows up on these rocks. It made me wonder about the number of times that God has done miraculous things for us and we end up taking them for granted and seeing them as the norm. It also made me wonder about how wonderfully gracious God is, that for Elijah at this moment of being perhaps emotionally, spiritually, and physically drained by the previous experience, that God is now taking care of him in such a gracious way. It's very fascinating. What I liked about listening to this story and then going back into the text myself was noticing something different about the way it's worded. Um, when God tells um, Elijah to go to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai that we know that this is the Mount of God, he, was, he entered a cave and he spent a night there. And in the morning it says, the word of the Lord came to him and asked him a question. Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah expresses his grief, his concern, his frustration, and he talks about not just that he's the only one left, but that the people of Israel have completely rejected God, done, done away with all of the right um, uh, altars for God and, and are not worshiping him at all. And this just distresses him terribly, even after this great experience that he had. So the Lord tells him to go out and stand at the mountain. And we have these experiences that um, there's a powerful wind that hits the mountains and the rocks. But the Lord's presence wasn't felt in that. It wasn't really heard there. And then there was a great earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in that. There was fire. Why, I wonder, are these the three things that are being used? The great wind, earthquake, and fire. But it isn't until the gentle breeze comes through that Elijah feels and senses the presence of God. And it's at that point that he covers his face with his mantle. I'm wondering about the significance of his mantle and about the idea of covering your face in the presence of God. But it's here at this verse that we hear the words expressed this way. Previously, before this experience happened, it said the word of the Lord came to um, Elijah and asked him a question, what are you doing here? This time, it says when it came about, Elijah heard it and he wrapped his face in the mantle and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, and it says here, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Same question, but this time it was a voice. Elijah answers him the exact same way as he answered before. I'm frustrated. I'm all alone. The people have forsaken you. They have destroyed your altars and they're worshiping other idols. And yet God tells him something. And if you go back into the text, you will notice that besides telling Elijah to go and pass his mantle of faith on to his prophet mantle on to Elisha, he's also told that he is to anoint two kings. He is to anoint, um, oh, I'm not even going to tell you. I think you should go and look yourself. He's going, supposed to anoint two kings and then he's supposed to give his mantle to Elisha. 
So this may be, and then he tells him there are 7,000 others who are obeying me and following me. I find this really interesting. So many times we're off thinking that we're the only ones doing any good work. And in our own sense of frustration, we take on the power ourselves and we think that we're totally alone. And God never leaves us alone. Not only is God with us, but there are others who are serving him. How unbelievably egoistic is it us, of us to think that we're the only ones? And next, what are we doing to be ready to pass the mantle of what we have been given by God in order for it to pass on to the next generation? This passing of the mantle is really significant. So it should make us ask the question, what are we doing to pass the faith on to the next generation? What are we doing to share what we have so there is someone to carry the work on for us? So the wonder week questions become, when we are depressed, we can trust that God is there and God is going to take care of us and his grace abounds. And the other wonder then becomes, where are the other people that God is, is using and are we ready to see who they are? Next, what, are, what kinds of ways are we looking for God's voice to speak to us? And are we missing it because we're looking for the big things instead of the little things? And next, who are we preparing to take the mantle from us? I hope you have a great week.